Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Fred Lubno. I'm with Princeton Hydro, and this is Pat Rose, one of our project managers. We're the environmental and, uh, and engineering consultant to uh, the Lake Capacon Commission and the Lake Capacon Foundation. This is the first of two public meetings um, uh, with regards to considering oxygenation in Lake Capacon. So this is a feasibility study. It's being paid for through funding through the New Jersey Highlands Council for this study, and it was awarded to uh, Morris County. So and then we were hired to conduct the study. And um, this first public presentation is going to focus on, you know, why are we considering oxygenation for Lake Apacon? So I'll give a little background on that. Um, we'll talk about some of the work we've done. Um, to get to where we are now, which is at this point, we're really working with a subcontractor who specializes in this technology, Paul Ganser. He's working on the actual design and the costs. So we have some very, very preliminary costs and design. We're going to have a second public meeting after we meet with DEP regard, with regards to permitting and approval, but we'll have a second public meeting and Paul Ganser will either be here in person or he'll be here virtually and he will really present the details of the design, the infrastructure and the associated costs. So thank you for, for showing up. Um, I almost always start any presentation on harmful algal blooms, which are caused in freshwater systems almost exclusively by cyanobacteria, that to get a harmful algal bloom, you really need three things most of the time. You need high seasonal temperatures, uh, still water conditions or thermal stratification. So think of stagnant water, water that's not moving a lot. And then higher phosphorus concentrations. So phosphorus concentrations higher than 0 0.03 milligrams per liter or more tends to generate these nasty blooms that we all remember in uh, uh, 2019. And I can see, you were, we're in this area, Lake Apacom was not the only lake that suffered this uh, in June of 2019. Uh, we monitor and manage a lot of lakes in northern New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, in southeastern New York, and a lot of the lakes we worked on at this time had these harmful algal blooms. And this is really the reason why, is we got into this weather pattern in June of 2019, where we would have these very intense short bursts of rain that were enough to rinse the watershed, put the nitrogen and the phosphorus into the lake, but not flush out the nutrients or the algae. So you can see we'd have these intense bouts of rain and then a few days of sunny weather. And this pattern uh, was very routine in, through the month of June. Now, if you look at Lake Capacon itself, so I'm actually gonna walk over here because I don't have my pointer, but we want to keep the lake on average at 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. And this is showing you 30 years of data. This is the average June concentration. So each dot represents about nine samples collected in the month of June. In 2019, it was the first time in 20 years that that average June concentration went above 0 0.04. That's what triggered those halves is that we got an unusually high amount of phosphorus in 2019, and that's really what triggered the blooms. Again, not only in Lake Apacon, we saw this in lakes throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, and that's what ended up happening. Now, it was very frustrating at the time because if you look at surface water concentrations, so this is surface water over the entire growing season. Again, we have a 30-year data set, and you can see that. Um, so the commission was formed around 2000, did a lot of harvesting. We implemented a lot of stormwater projects. So you can see surface water concentrations were on the decline. So it was very frustrating that, well, if we're reducing phosphorus in the surface water, why did we get these halves? So yeah, if you, but if you look at the deep water immediately over the sediments, this is what was going on. So even though we were taking care of the watershed, we were dealing with stormwater management, septic management, we we're harvesting the weeds, which removes nutrients. We weren't really focusing on the bottom waters, the waters immediately over the sediments. They have been steadily increasing. So um, we essentially had a one-two punch at Lake at Hapakon compared to other lakes. So case in point, lakes like Lake Mohawk had a bloom very similar. 
But after two weeks, that bloom was gone. Another lake we work on in Pennsylvania, Harvey's Lake, it suffered a bloom around the same time. That bloom was gone in two weeks. In contrast, at Lake Apacon, what happened was the bloom stayed over the entire growing season. So what happened was the rain rinsed the watershed, triggered the blooms, but those deep phosphorus rich waters allowed the blooms to continue. So um, the cyanobacteria that produce the nasty scums, they have what are called gas vacuoles. So they can move up and down the water column pretty quickly. So when they have those gas vacuoles, that's what happens. They make these surface scums, they're right at the surface. And the advantage to that is they can outcompete the good algae because now they can photosynthesize and shade out everything else. But then what they do is they collapse those gas vacuoles and they sink down. And then they can take advantage of that phosphorus rich water. Layered on top of that is climate change. This is the surface water temperature of Lake Apacon just for July, mid Lake Station. And we see a statistically significant increase in temperature at Lake Apacon over the last 30 years, not only in the surface waters, but we also graphed it for immediately over the sediments as well. So the water's getting warmer. These blue-green algae or cyanobacteria can take advantage of that deep, rich phosphorus environment. That's how we ended up with the halves that stayed over the entire growing season. So we really had to update our, our strategy with Lake Apacon. And what's interesting is if you look at the lake's phosphorus budget on an annual basis, that internal phosphorus load, so the phosphorus that's coming from the sediments, only accounts for less than 10% of the available phosphorus on an annual basis. But if you look at it on a summer basis, particularly during a dry year where you're not having, you don't have a lot of rain, that phosphorus load from those sediments can account for up to 70% of the daily phosphorus. So even though on an annual basis, that internal load is small, during the summer, proportionally, it is really fueling those cyanobacteria blooms. So, and like I said, the cyanobacteria have that advantage that they can fuel up on that phosphorus rich water and then float back to the surface. So to address this internal phosphorus load, there are primarily three in lake restoration ways of dealing with this. The first is called nutrient inactivation. So it's using some sort of product like alum, um, phoslock, which we used in the Southern end a few years ago um, at Landing Channel. Um, you can use calcium depending on the chemistry of your lake or iron, but adding a product to basically inactivate that phosphorus. As a matter of fact, we'll be doing an inactivation treatment with Lake Apacon next year. We're putting in for the permits, we've done the studies. And so we're actually going to do that. The, in, the, the inactivation is sort of like a bridge to get you to some sort of longstanding restoration technique, which I'll take talk about uh, in a few minutes. But Lake Mohawk had this long-term strategy that they used to do these nutrient inactivation to get the water quality under control. But now they have a D-strat system, which keeps the lake well mixed. So that's the second one. So the first is nutrient inactivation. You're putting in a product, you know, that basically binds with the phosphorus. The second is called aeration. And this is what a lot of people think about. You see a fountain in a pond, or you see some bubbles at the surface. It's basically you're mixing or circulating the water. And the reason why you're doing that is um, in deep lakes where you have no oxygen at the bottom, there's this chemical reaction that when there's no oxygen at the bottom, this bond between iron and phosphorus is broken. So that phosphorus starts to leach up into the overlying waters. And that's what's fueling the algae. If you keep that system well oxygenated, so you have oxygen down there, that bond between iron and phosphorus, it sticks. And then it's not available for algae growth. So aeration, like one of the most common ways of aerating a lake is called destratification. Like I said, at Lake Mohawk, we have a destratification system. It keeps the entire lake well mixed. So it prevents a depletion of dissolved oxygen at the bottom. Um, it can be a very efficient way of keeping that system well oxygenated. But when you mix that entire water column, overall, you make the lake warmer. And I'll, I'll explain why that's an important component when it comes to Lake Apacon. And then finally, the third one, which is a relatively new technique. I mean, it's been around for about 20 years, 
but just recently it's sort of been upgraded. Um, it's the generation of oxygen. So instead of keeping the water well mixed, now we're actually generating oxygen and pumping it into those deep waters. So again, if it's oxygenated, that bond between iron and phosphorus sticks and that phosphorus is not available for growth. So those are the three ways that we typically use to address this uh, internal phosphorus load. So we did, we are recommending oxygenation for several reasons. Um, the one advantage is, is we can literally dial in a concentration of dissolved oxygen where with aeration, it's all or none. You have to have enough power to keep that system mixed so you don't deplete of dissolved oxygen in the bottom. Oxygenation, you can actually modify it depending on how much organic matter you have down in the sediments. Um, so it, and because you're oxygenating, the advantage is, is you're keeping that, that, that iron and that phosphorus bond. Um, but also the other advantage to oxygenation is we can keep that thermal stratification. So we can keep, you know how if you jump into a lake and at the surface it's real warm, but if you dive down a little, all of a sudden it gets cold, you have that sharp change in temperature, that's called thermal stratification. And in a lot of deep lakes where you have thermal stratification over the summer months, that's if you have any carryover trout, that's where they're gonna hang out because they prefer the cooler waters. What well, a pack on over the years, we've been seeing this habitat sort of get compressed because even though it's cooler, we have less oxygen and trout need cooler waters, higher amounts of dissolved oxygen. The advantage to oxygenation is we can actually not only help deal with the phosphorus, but we can expand that trout habitat, which is gonna be very important. And the, and the last thing I do wanna mention is the cost of the technology has really declined, particularly over the last 10 years. Um, the study we did in uh, 20, 21 to to get to this conclusion we were we were very surprised how the price of the technology is actually very similar to destratification now so i always say this any restoration technique you're going to implement there's no there's no magic pill there's no magic bullet there's always advantages and limitations so the limitations with dissolved oxygen there are annual electrical costs that's something that's going to have to be considered. You need money to power the system. So that's something that, you know, we'll have to discuss and hash out. There is a limited amount of maintenance involved with these systems. And again, this doesn't matter if it's aeration, if it's layered air, if it's oxygenation, they do require a certain amount of maintenance. Um, existing lines or infrastructure in the lake, and there are concerns with possibly impacting the infrastructure with the anchors. Now, I did talk to Paul Ganser. Um, at uh, at last week at the North American Lake Management Society, he said the way the structures are made, they have minimal Im anchors have minimal impacts. But I still want to put it in there just in case something happens. Um, we do know that the shoreline structures will more than likely require permits and approvals. So we're setting a meeting up with DEP to get to to take care of that. And then finally, you know, these limitations I want to emphasize would apply to any form of aeration. So whether it's oxygenation or destratification, these are these are limitations you have to take into consideration. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to pass it over to Pat because to figure out how much oxygen we need, uh, and that is a direct relationship of how many units we need, how much electricity we need, we had to do this sediment oxygen demand study. And I'll let Pat run with this since he was out in the field with Paul Ganser uh, in April. All right. Thanks, Fred. Um, as Fred just said, this SOD study was really our first step in, in designing this system. Um, and we needed to calculate how much ox the, ox the current oxygen demand of the lake. And we wanted to do that for two reasons. The first was uh, as a feasibility, you know, to determine or confirm that if oxygenation is a cost-effective method to reduce the internal phosphorus load in Lake Pakong, and then if it is, we need to know how much oxygen we need to generate to keep the lake oxygenated. And so the SOD, sediment oxygen demand, is the predominant contributor to oxygen depletion in stratified lakes. Um, so we conducted this analysis in late April, uh, Paul Ganser and myself, in the deepest section of Lake Apakong. And while we were out there, we also collected samples for uh, phosphorus analysis from the sediment. We wanted to quantify the different um, forms of phosphorus in the sediment. 
So I'll briefly describe how we conducted the study. So the pictures on the left show the um, sediment oxygen demand chambers. There was four of those chambers in total. Three of those chambers had an open cavity on the bottom. So they were in direct contact with the sediment. Those were the three that we used for the sediment oxygen demand. Um, the reason we use three of them is just to ensure that we get reliable data if one of them gets knocked out of place or something. And then the fourth chamber um, is closed on the bottom. There are pumps that allow water to fill up. That's to measure the water oxygen demand. And we wanted to differentiate between the two because even though the SOD chambers are um, you know, calculating the rate of depletion from the sediment, but there's also water in there. So to get the true SOD, we had to remove the uh, the little bit of contribution from the water oxygen demand. And then each, each one of these chambers has a dissolved oxygen sensor inside. So, you know, the equipment and the setup, it's pretty complicated, but the actual analysis is relatively straightforward where, you know, we deployed them one morning and then we just measured the rate of depletion uh, over a 24 hour period. So this picture on the left shows uh, Paul Ganser deploying one of the oxygen chambers. And then the picture on the right just shows uh, those are the four buoys attached to the uh, the SOD chambers that were at the bottom of the lake. Again, that was at the deepest section of the lake, so we were at about 15 meters there. Um, and so normally this this analysis would only take two days. We would drop the uh, the chambers down, leave them in overnight, and see what the rate of depletion is. But of course, you know, we put them in, and then that night we got extreme winds, and all the the chambers got knocked out of place. So we had to wait a day for the uh, you know, the wind to calm down. We ended up resetting them. And in the end, we got enough data. Um, you know, two of the three SOD chambers ended up producing reliable data. And that was, you know, plenty to work with. So these figures show the rates of oxygen depletion from the different chambers. I know you probably can't really see the, um, you know, the fine print, but the, the x-axis on each figure is the time of day. And the y-axis is dissolved oxygen concentration. And if you look at the two figures on the left, those are the two SOD chambers that you know stayed put and produced reliable data. So you can see both of those have um, strong linear relationships of a, a negative, you know, an oxygen depletion over time. Both of those have uh, R squared values of 0.999 or greater. So what that means is that the linear regression model fits almost perfectly uh, um, on top of our, our measured data points. And that's exactly what we wanted to see. That just means we have really reliable data to work with. The figure on the top right, that's one of the chambers, um, one of the three that even on the second try did get knocked out of place. So from the, there was still some wind, that one got knocked out of place and, and it lost contact, you know, direct contact with the sediment. So there was just lake water mixing in. That's why the uh, there's no oxygen depletion. It kind of stays oxygenated the whole time. And then the bottom right, that's the water oxygen demand uh, chamber. And I just wanted to show, you know, the difference in the rate of oxygen depletion of the water oxygen demand from the sediment oxygen demand. That just shows how, you know, how important addressing those sediments are um, with oxygenation technology. And I, I do want to emphasize that that oxygen demand is basically, if you think of those dark waters cut off from the surface, so you're not getting atmospheric oxygenation, it's dark down there, so you don't have any photosynthesis from plants or algae. And as plants and algae photosynthesize, they produce oxygen. But what you do have along the sediments is are bacteria, and they're just crunching up all the organic matter. But to do that, they need the oxygen. So that's what's causing that oxygen demand, this microbial growth that's crunching up the organic matter. And so this table just shows some of the... Uh the data from our SOD study, it's pretty technical, so I'm not really going to get into too much. I just wanted to highlight, you know, I highlighted in those red boxes, shows that we took the data from the two SOD chambers that produced reliable results, and we averaged those together. Um, so we went from the observed rate of change in milligrams per liter, um, we converted that to uh, grams of oxygen per meter squared per day. We did that because we know the exact area of each oxygen chamber. And then, you know, from there, we can multiply that by the size of the anoxic zone of the uh, entire lake to get the uh, the sediment oxygen demand of the lake. And then we also, you know, as I mentioned before, we did subtract the water oxygen demand from the sediment oxygen demand to get the uh, the true SOD. And one other thing I wanted to point out is that 
the temperature at the time of the study was around eight degrees Celsius at the bottom of the lake, which is, is much is cooler than the bottom of the lake when the lake is stratified during the summer. During the summer months towards the end of the season, I think typically the bottom of the lake gets closer to 12 or 13 degrees Celsius. And uh, as temperatures increase, the, ox the rate, the oxygen demand also increases. So we corrected or Paul corrected that, uh, that SOD to a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. And that's the one we'll be using for, uh, for Lake Apacom. Yeah, as I mentioned, we also took some samples for sediment analysis. We took these from four different sites in the lake. Uh, three of the sites were three of the deepest pockets in the lake. And then the fourth site, which is that was site number three up there, represents, it was uh, about 40 feet deep and that kind of better represents, uh, you know, the average area of uh, the anoxic depth of the anoxic zone. Um, so what, what this figure shows is that the colors aren't really showing up as colorful as they are on the, up, up on the screen, but the, the darker color that's red, that represents iron bound phosphorus. And then the blue represents aluminum bound phosphorus. Those are the two dominant uh, fractions of phosphorus in the sediment. We're really just concerned with the, the iron you know, as Fred mentioned before, that's the form of phosphorus uh, that is, you know, affected by low DO concentrations under oxygenated condition, conditions. The sediment, excuse me, the phosphorus and the iron in the sediment is locked in together. But once that oxygen is gone, that bond breaks apart and the phosphorus is released. So that's the, the fraction we're concerned with. We're not really concerned with the high level of aluminum phosphorus. That's going to stay bound up, uh, you know, with the aluminum even under low DO uh, situations. And so this is what we wanted to see, um, you know, when it comes to determining if, if oxygen is oxygenation is going to work. Um, because if we have a large pool of, of iron in the sediment, which we do, um, it just means, you know, there's a lot of iron to bind with that phosphorus uh, when it's oxygenated. And so the actual iron to phosphorus ratios are provided in the table at the bottom. And those ranged from 22 to 24. So those are, are very high. And again, that's a, that's a good sign um, with oxygenation. So, you know, the main conclusions from our study, um, the SOD in Lake Apakong is very high. These results support the empirical data that we've collected over the past 30 years at Lake Apakong. And the iron to phosphorus ratios, uh, you know, as I said, vary between 22 to 24, which exceeds the threshold of success of 15 based on uh, past studies with oxygen systems. And so basically Lake, Lake Apakong is a strong candidate for the installation of an oxygenation system to control the internal phosphorus load. And then uh, before I move on, I'm going to briefly touch on the preliminary design. I don't know if you had any other comments on um, the study. The only thing I'll emphasize is um, the reason why, one of the reasons why Lake Apakong is a good candidate for this technology, this, this oxygenation is, like Pat said, you have a lot of iron down there compared to how much phosphorus you have. That ratio between iron and phosphorus is 20, is 22 to 24. That means you, you can take advantage of that iron. All you have to do is add oxygen and that iron will bind up with that phosphorus. So as Fred mentioned, I'm, I'm gonna very briefly discuss the preliminary design. Paul, Paul Ganser is currently working on the, the specific design for a PACOM. So I'll just touch on the, the technology that he's using. So. This is called Oxygen Saturation Technology, or OST. This was designed by Paul Ganser uh, based on, you know, a few, a few different oxygenation techniques that have been used in lake management for the past few decades. Um, and the way that this technology works is that oxygen is produced on the shoreline. So we're not, we wouldn't, we won't have to, um, you know, ship in liquid oxygen as was the case in, in, in the past. We can generate oxygen on the shore. And then that's pumped directly to um, contact chambers, which will be at the bottom of the lake in the, the deepest pockets of the lake. At those contact chambers, water will be withdrawn from the bottom of the lake. So, um, you know, low DO water will be withdrawn. It'll be mixed inside of the contact chamber with pure oxygen and then discharged back out over the sediment. And one of the key features is that, or two key features are, are that 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 high DO water is going to be discharged directly over the sediment. So as Fred said, that'll be, you know, oxygenating um, that organic, breaking down that organic material, which may actually reduce the overall oxygen demand over time. And then it does this in a manner where it, it won't, you know, there's no mixing, it won't induce any turbulence. So that'll preserve that thermal stratification pattern. 
These systems are designed with automated DO sensors. So they're highly efficient. You know, it'll take um, readings of, uh, you know, current DO concentrations at the bottom of the lake, and then we'll adjust the oxygen output based on your desired uh, concentration. So if things are, are oxygen's really high towards the end of the season, you might be able to shut off the oxygen if it's not needed. Um, and, you know, another key feature is they're, they're modular and scalable. So we currently are still, or Paul's kicking around a few different ideas of how many shoreline structures and how many oxygen compressors, uh, oxygen generators will need, because they can be, you know, we could have a, a maybe four smaller ones or two larger ones. There's different ways that this can be uh, approached. And then as Fred mentioned, these are very preliminary cost estimates. These were, were not provided by Paul Ganser. These were, you know, from our experience working with similar projects at other lakes, you know, on, on somewhat smaller scales, but we're estimating a capital cost somewhere between 1.5 to 2.5 million. And then the annual operation and maintenance, this is a little bit harder to gauge um, based on the oxygen generation, but, you know, it could be around $100,000 a year. Um, again, it's possible if this system over time starts to reduce the overall oxygen demand of the lake, you might be able to reduce the amount of oxygen that you're pumping out, which would reduce those costs uh, potentially over time. And then Paul's going to be able to refine these a lot more as he's working on his design. Yeah, like um, Pat was saying, you know, Paul is working on this. We have seen the price go down. These prices are based on 2021 when we did our internal load assessment. So we're hoping they're gonna go down, but I, I did pull from that report. It's not in the presentation, but I wanna compare this to some other technology. So a D-strat system, a typical, if we, if we didn't wanna do oxygenation, we're just gonna mix the whole lake. That price back in 2021 was between 900,000 and 2.5 million, depending on how many compressors and where they're located. And the maintenance and operation cost of a D-strat system is between 1.2 and 1.6. A um, layered air system, which we didn't even get into, which would allow oxygenation along the bottom and keep that trout habitat, that would start at 2.5 million. So we're not even considering that type of aeration. So I just wanted to put that in context that it's not like, oh, well, if we go with standard D-strat, it'll be so much cheaper. If anything, I think a D-strat system would be more expensive because you would need a lot more lines and you would need more compressors around the shoreline compared to the oxygenation. So, so, so. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so, um, yeah, moving forward with the oxygenation, like I said, Paul Ganser, the sub we're working with on this, He's working on the final design and talking with Paul, we're talking about anywhere between two to four shoreline locations. So obviously there are a lot of conversations that we need to have with the commission, the foundation of the state park, the counties, the municipalities. And again, we have to you know, talk to um, you know, local stakeholders of where will these stations go? Um, they could be as large as 12 by 12 for these oxygen generators, or they could be eight by 12. The smaller footprint would be if you needed four. The larger footprint would be if you only needed two. Um, oxygenation has been used in a lake in Northwestern New Jersey. Um, it was installed about a year ago. We've had some very promising results, but like Pat mentioned, what we see is whenever these systems first go in, it looks like you tend to need more oxygen, but as you break down that organic matter, you should be able to dial down the amount of oxygen you need. Um, and then finally, you know, well um, oxygenation over most of the growing season uh, at that lake I've mentioned, we've seen a little dip in DO just below that change in temperature, that thermocline. But the nice thing is the data we have for that lake um, for 2023, we had no major HAB event and we had very low phosphorus concentrations through the water column. So again, we do have a test case in New Jersey that one of these systems were installed, but even that is gonna be different in that um, we're now looking at, like Pat mentioned, most of the infrastructure being actually in the deep end of the lake. You know, it's not gonna be all on the shoreline. You're trying to minimize how much infrastructure goes on the shoreline. Um, so finally moving forward, um, you know, Pat 
And Paul did the study you saw so that we could calculate how much phosphorus is needed. And again, Paul is using that data to come up with the sizing and the cost of those systems. We did have a technical meeting with DEP in September. Um, we presented this because to DEP, this is new technology. Um, they were very positive. Um, at this point, we're waiting for some follow-up questions. So they were very positive. They said they'll, they'll, they'll talk amongst themselves. They'll give us questions. We'll answer those questions. And then what we want to then do is have a second meeting with them to determine what type of permitting or approvals are required. So we're still waiting to get those questions back from DEP. So that's where we are right now. Um, there will be a second public meeting. I would like to have that second public meeting. Well, number one, after Paul finishes his design and cost estimates, but number two, after we have that meeting with DEP, because I would like the public meeting where we could provide you with what the design would look like, what the costs will be, what permits are required. That will be the next phase. And that would be the second public meeting. So that's what we have for this. The first public meeting, we wanted to introduce the technology and also tell you why this type of technology was selected for Lake Apacon. So thank you. Good question. Yep. Does this technology help with sediment reduction as well as to, to a degree. The, the, the thing is, is it's going to take care of the organic matter and you need very little organic matter to leach phosphorus up into the water because all you need is just a little layer of organic matter and no oxygen and it can be leached. It's not going to, number one, it's, it's oxygenating just the deep part of the lake. So it's not, it's not doing oxygenation near the near shore stuff. Number one. And number two is most of that material is inorganic. So a lot of it, so like Pat showed, a lot of iron down there. So it's not going to crunch up that iron, but what it will do is it will keep that iron bond with any phosphorus in there. So it, it, it will help to break up that organic matter, but it's not like you're going to see a measurement, a decline in the sediments. So if you had a shallow lake situation with heavy sedimentation, it's really not going to help make that it, deeper. Again, it, it might, you know, if... A lot of times this type of type of technology can be used, say, in a sewage lagoon. A sewage lagoon, you have huge amounts of organic matter. So a lot of times the bacterial products and the oxygenation, it can really help crunch up a lot because you have a lot of organic matter. So if you had a shallow area with a lot of organic matter, it may help to reduce it somewhat. But nine times out of 10, most of the material is inorganic and it's not going to chew up the dirt. It's just going to focus on the organic layer. It's not going to be like dredging, you know, the, the set of yeah. Fred? Um, the, the public questions, they're having a hard time hearing the questions on the virtual options. If you could just repeat them. Oh, sure. It, that'd yep. be great. Thank Should you. I repeat that question? We typed it into that? the chat, so yeah. they got that one. Okay, all right. Future Thank rates. you. Yeah. All right. These are yeah, these are only placed in the deepest part of the lake. How do you figure how many units you need to place at the bottom? So that's the calculate. Well, did you want to? Well, I mean, the, the question was. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, he asked if these these units are being placed in the deepest part of the lake. How, how are we figuring out how many of these units we need? So Paul Paul Ganser, the engineer, he's doing that by once we calculated the um, the oxygen demand, he's then you know taking that and then we we know how much oxygen we need to pump in on a daily or annual basis, and then he's it comes down to how much oxygen we need to generate, and then um, it that I think from my understanding that could be done with a few larger structures or more smaller structures. There's multiple ways to go about it, but so it all comes down to the the amount of oxygen that we need to, you know, pump into the lake. But the point is to affect the whole lake, the borders in the whole lake. It, this is so we're we're targeting what we call the anoxic zone, which I'm drawing a blank on. It's, on what it's 900 because I I made sure to look that up. It's 976 acres is the section we're focusing on. So it's the center deep part of the lake. We're not we're we're not focusing on the shallow areas. We're only focusing on the area where the internal load occurs. But 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 is the improvement produced by that going to circulate through the water of the whole lake? No, it's only focusing on inactivating that internal phosphorus load. So it's it's designed to take care of that anoxic zone, which is 976 acres. So it's only focusing on the internal load. There isn't an anoxic zone in more shallow areas. 
Um, based on all the data we have, no. I mean, when we have 30 years of, of data to show, you know, where the anoxia happens. The other thing, too, is as part of that study that we did the anoxic assessment, we also updated the bathymetric survey of the lake. So we have updated data that we could layer on our vertical profiles of temperature and dissolved oxygen. So we have a very good representation of what that anoxic zone area and volume is. And that's what that's calculated on. But the balloons occur in the shallow areas commonly. Well, and how they start is from the watershed. And that's why, like I showed that graph where you saw phosphorus in the surface waters have been going down. We have been focusing on the watershed and we need to continue to focus on the watershed. We need, you know, sewering of Jefferson. We need to continue stormwater management. So this, again, it's not a magic bullet. It will take care of the internal load, but we need to continue with the watershed efforts because you're right, the watershed efforts bring in that phosphorus and stimulate that near shore algae. But once that near shore algae blooms, how it perpetuates over a pack on is, goes up and down vertically, takes up that internal load, comes back up. So it's, it's a two pronged approach. The watershed measures will take care of the shallow areas. The oxygenation will take care of that deep internal phosphorus load. I also want to add quick. So, you know, blooms can manifest in shallow areas like, like Crescent Cove, but a lot of times too, they, you know, start in the open water section and then get blown, you know, wind blown to certain sections or shorelines. And they're getting their phosphorus like we saw, like we saw in, in that June demonstration, they're getting that phosphorus from the watershed where, you know, we had those high surface water concentrations in June that triggered the bloom. But what allowed it to keep going was the internal phosphorus load. We know that because we know the cyanobacteria that we identified like Anfanazomenon and Dolictospermum have those gas vacuoles. And we know they move up and down the water column. I love algae. <laughs> Say the watershed around the lake. Are you talking the natural watershed? Or so are you, you talking like in Roxbury here, where they just a couple of months, a couple years ago, added 300 catch bases in the Shore Hills area. I live in Kings Cove. There's a lot of problems that we've had since they've put them up there because we have to use lake friendly fertilizer for one thing, but we have all of this stuff coming down, and, and it which would have naturally come down without the catch bases. Mm -hmm. Now we got all these catch bases. The water, when it comes into King's Cove, it's unbelievable. And it, it's bringing down whatever anybody's using up in a mountain, and they're not worrying about lake friendly fertilizer. Mm -hmm. so all of that's coming in. I got an, I got myself in a bind because I said, you want to fix the problem, start at the bottom of the hill and fill all the catch bases up with cement. And let the natural water come into the lake. Well, see, I, I, so the question was, was about the watershed. And I do want to say a watershed is, is, is cause I, I actually teach a class on watershed management at Del Val. And the, the first class I always tell the students, the watershed is like a funnel. And at the bottom of the funnel is the lake or stream. And so any land, any water that hits that funnel, it's going to go in. So the watershed is basically that, um, the catch basin issue, um, if they're not, properly designed or maintained, yes, they can just basically shunt that water quickly right into a water body conveying those nutrients. I wouldn't recommend just cementing them off because you could actually make it worse because now you don't even have a temporary reduction. Now you're just having those surface runoff just go directly in. But some of the stuff that we've worked with, with the foundation and the, uh, and the commission and the municipalities and the counties, what we're trying to do is convert a lot of those existing catch basins so that they have uh, their multi-chamber baffle boxes so that they hold the sediments. And actually, you know, a 30 to 40% of your phosphorus is coming in is stuck on the sediment particles. So just by having those baffle boxes, that can reduce the phosphorus. But if you link those baffle boxes to green infrastructure, so a lot of times we'll recommend you put a baffle box in where your catch basin is, and then maybe a vegetated swale or some sort of vegetation, because the nice thing about that is the basin will take care of the solids. But like you're saying, the fertilizers, that's dissolved phosphorus. How are you going to take care of that? 
that's with the green infrastructure. So if you have the bioswales or the vegetation, or if you can divert it into say a forested area, let the vegetation take care of that. I mean, in even very urbanized areas or suburbanized areas where we really don't have land to do green infrastructure, that's why we try to put in the floating wetland islands. And we try to put them in areas where you have a swale coming in or a pipe because they're getting that first flush. Again, trying to use the vegetation to suck up that dissolved phosphorus. No, in Florida, where I fish with my brother, there's nothing. I mean, there, you don't see it except for mm -hmm. whatever rains. It's in late, late or usually late Saturday or Thursday. Yeah, and then they have they have a lot of phosphorus down there, and they and I don't know where you were at in Florida. They may have had uh, I don't know if it was marine and estuarine or just fresh water, but there are different types of algae that cause blooms, like on the coast of Florida as opposed to the lakes. Okay. The uh, units uh, that are on the shoreline are they one for one with the with the equipment in the lake? You spread. You have you have one. Uh, uh, so the question is. Multiple. Yeah, so the question is, you know, is there a one to one ratio between shoreline uh, buildings that will house the, the oxygen generators and then the in lake oxygen chambers? I, I don't I think I think that could be. I don't think it's set in stone yet, but I, I, I think so. I think it's one to one. I think there's one chamber per shoreline structure. I think that's what he's that that's what he's trying to accomplish. So you're going to get 960 acres covered with just two or four of these. Well, that's that's what he's working on. You know, it's a it's a it's a high demand of phosphorus. I'm sorry, a high demand of of oxygen that's needed. So, um for the lake up in northwestern New Jersey, it's slightly different that yeah. that in lake system, the one in northern New Jersey is slightly different um yeah, it's slightly different for okay. the in-lake structure. Right. Um, but I know he's trying to minimize the the number of stations. But um, I, again, it's 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 math. It's like you're trying to overcome that demand on a daily basis. Can you generate enough of that oxygen? I mean, something that we're really interested in, um, and we, you know, the data we have for this lake um, north of here. Uh, showed that this is the case but the question we have is do you have a reduction of efficiency of as that oxygen is spreading out over the sediments um and so that's something that again paul gansers working on and I, I like i said we're we're working with paul he's he's an engineer this is the only thing he does are these systems and he goes around the country to to uh to uh install these systems and i'm also not i'm not sure how so each chamber is going to have a discharge structure i'm not sure those those might be relatively long i'm not really sure how the you know the the length of those so i have the feeling yeah. they'd be relatively larger when paul's here for the second meeting ask him all of those questions So um, it was a very, so the question was the lake north of here that has this system in, what sort of permits re were required? So we do the monitoring for that lake. We did not do any of the, the permitting or the management for that. So we have the data, the water quality data. So number one, I don't think they needed any permits, but it's because they had an existing structure that was already used for aeration. So this lake used to have layered air. So they already had an existing structure. So the permitting may have been simpler. Uh, and them being a private lake association too, might've had uh, uh, something to do with it. With this, because Lake Apacon is a public lake and because Lake Apacon is, uh, you know, has a state aquatic park, you know, DEP wanted to be involved. So we're looking to do a similar analysis like this for Swartzwood. Again, a state, you know, lake. So DEP wants to be involved in that. But I think the big part is because there was already a shoreline structure at this at this particular lake. I think that made it a lot easier in terms of permitting and approvals. It, 
we're not sure to be honest we're, the well, in-lake structure we're not sure that's what we need to find out we're yeah. not sure what they're going to require require right now but but, uh, but i can say from from other aeration projects that any permitting you're right it hasn't been putting the thing the putting the aeration equipment in the lake it has been you know the flood hazard and the wetlands of the structure you're putting on the shoreline that and again that's just based on our experience with aeration systems it it hasn't been the thing that's in the water it's the structure that's on the shoreline so there may be some you know like i said flood hazard you know wetland just confirming there's no, there's no wetlands on the site stuff like that when you, when you deliver oxygen to the deep areas does it just does it stay there or does it end the rise or it's so it's it's my understanding is it's it's spreading out and it's spreading up and again from the data we've seen for the lake up in northern new jersey we've seen it spread up and then when it got to the thermocline um where it sees that change in in temperature we saw a dip in dissolved oxygen so it was taking care of that deep water but it wasn't getting up into the thermocline so it's spreading again just from the data that i've looked at for this lake i'm talking about it spreads out and up and also, if you think about a stratified lake, how it has the, the three layers, you know, the, the upper epilimnion and then the lower hypolimnion, that, that whole bottom layer is circulating already. So that oxygen will, you know, circulate throughout that, that bottom layer. You know, that water is always kind of circulating yep. down there. So is this an ongoing or just once you put it in or whatever, is it forever? Do you live with it or it comes and goes? So... Yes and no. Yes, once it's in, I mean, if this is what you're going to use to oxygenate that deep water, yes. Now, what what we're seeing is the amount of oxygen you need over time should decline. But it's not, it's not like, oh, we can do this five years and then we're done. So again, I, like I said, everything has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage to doing nutrient inactivation, say with alum, is you're putting that product it's settling down to the sediment. That aluminum, like, like Pat showed, will bind with that phosphorus, whether there's oxygen or not. The advantage to that is once you do that treatment, you're done. You're good. Now, over time, you may have to do another treatment, maybe five years later. So, and it's not going to oxygenate those deeper waters. The advantage to this is you're going to oxygenate the deeper waters. Some people don't want to use some sort of chemical to put in the water, um, but the limitation is you have maintenance and you have electrical costs. I think just to tack on to that, a few questions online have been, does the system run constantly or will it only be activated as needed when the lake water is not moving um, naturally enough? And then another one was how many months a year would the oxygenation system operate? I think they kind of tag on. So I thought I'd throw those out. Oh, also thank you. you have answers. Yeah, so typically, yeah. What you want to do is you want to have the system operating during the growing season. So you would turn it on, say, March, April, and then maybe shut it down September, um, October. Now, I know Paul has been talking about maybe running it over the course of a whole year to try to crunch up that organic matter. But I'm just thinking in terms of costs, you know, having it run year round, if, if you're just doing it just to crunch up the organic matter, What's the harm of shutting it down, you know, and saving that cost and then starting it back up if, if your goal is to keep it oxygenated? So that's a conversation we'll have, you know, with Paul. But for classic aeration, what you do is you turn it on, like in the spring, you shut it off in the fall. Yes. Oh, sorry. We have some other online questions. Okay. Um, I, I, you Did you have a question? I'm sorry. You. Oh, I did. Okay. Yeah. I Okay, so um, right currently we have a private party that's interested in funding the system. Um, but if that's, you know, if that turns out to not be the case, then we will look for grant funding 
to um, install the system once we have all of the numbers and understand what the cost is. Foundation. Commission and Foundation. Commission and Foundation. Yeah. Um, so that also answers one of the online questions. We had a similar question online. So. Um, and I'll just run through the online questions. There aren't too many, and then we can go back to the yeah. live audience here. Um, what are the, or sorry, since oxygenation is not a natural occurrence, what are the negative effects to the lake, plant, and wildlife? So I would say oxygenation is a natural thing. It's just that um, it's not natural because the lake is stratified. And if anything, it would benefit, um, it would increase habitat. Because what you're doing is right now in that anoxic zone, the only thing living down there are ana uh, anaerobic bacteria. That's it. You just have bacteria. If you're oxygenating that hypolimnion, you're creating habitat. So if anything, it would help to improve habitat for aquatic life. And then the last question from online is, uh, will solar... Will solar system with battery store storage be considered as an option for powering the shore equipment? So historically, when we've tried to use solar with aeration, now we haven't done it with oxygenation, but I can tell you when we've done it with aeration, um, aeration has to be constant. Like, and I'm going to go back in the day in the 90s uh, when I started as a consultant, some of the aeration systems that we would operate uh, you'd have an electrical storm and then all of a sudden the aeration system is off and someone doesn't notice for a few days. Well, it only takes a few days for that thermal stratification to reestablish and have an anoxic zone. Well, at that point, you don't want to turn on the aeration system because if you turn it on, you're going to mix the whole lake and it's going to bring all those nutrients up and trigger a bloom. So um, you need a consistent source of energy. And from my experience with aeration, um, with solar systems, it's very difficult to get enough energy consistently to, to keep that system functioning. And so I, we can ask Paul about it, but I don't think it's doable. The only place we use solar-based aeration are very small ponds, and we use them to oxygenate underneath floating wetland islands, just because again, oxygenation helps to remove nutrients where underneath the island, sometimes you can be low in nutrients. So it's a way of doing that. So. I, we can ask Paul Ganser about that. That's it from okay. all for now. I have a related question. That's yep. the impact on microbes. It's so, again, we're focusing on the deep part of the lake. So it's really not designed to, to, to interact with the weeds. Because like that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So it's it's not um, again, we're, we're focusing on that. Um, yeah. Nine hundred and seventy six acres. And that area is the area that we're targeting is 19 feet or deeper. So plant growth really won't shouldn't be an issue for this. Yes. Will this affect the thermocline? Uh, the question is, is will this affect the thermocline? Bring it down. If it's your 20 feet, 25 feet, you're baked in. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what I'm wondering is. So it shouldn't affect the thermocline, but it should affect that oxygen profile associated with the thermocline. So what we want to see is we want the thermocline intact, but we want to see more oxygen like underneath it and in it. Um, and that's really to help expand that trout, that carryover trout habitat. So you should see a change in oxygen, but not in temperature. Of the 900 and change acres you're talking about treating, uh, where is that geographically located within the lake? Oh, you know, I have that map in my car yeah. too. It's 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 basically. Uh, I'm gonna forget a lot of the, the the names of the different points and stuff, but it's the main the main body of the lake. Um, south of Halsey, right? Yeah, south of Halsey, a little bit into I think Byram. Yes. Byram, definitely into Byram, up into Byram Cove, into Great Cove. It goes as south as what's the, the the point that comes off south of like the mid lake section? Yes, it 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 would be it wouldn't go past that. That's kind of like the cutoff area, a little bit north of there. So, yeah, and it doesn't go. It wouldn't go north of Brady Bridge. Right. So really, like if you picture like the main body of the lake into 
Byram Cove, yeah, large old, portion of Byram Cove. Yep. So it sounds like it's not really Roxbury. It's going to be going out to the back of Jefferson. Yeah. Rocks, I mean, Landing Channel is very, it's very shallow. Yeah. yeah. Just on the other side of it. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going. I, I don't know. Yeah, and no. don't know how deep King Cove is. It doesn't sound like I it's think, in there. So if you think about the areas of the lake, I think you said 19 feet or deeper. Yeah, or deeper. That's that's primarily what's being targeted. So if you're in a, co a shallow. Yeah, cove, I, I have that map in the car. I'm so sorry. I should have brought it. At least I could have held it up. I, I should know this, but I'm not sure. Down on Lake Landing, there's a that an aeration system that's working down there? So I so the one in River Styx is is a circulation system. So it's 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 not it's it's designed to keep the water moving to you know because like I showed at the beginning how the cyanobacteria like still water, they like high nutrients, they like warm water temperatures. So that's what what's that's functioning as. Then the near shore projects like at Shore Hills were nanobubble systems. So that again is a different type of technology that really focuses on smaller systems and near shore areas. So that is basically um, breaking up organic matter using very small bubbles. But again, it's not designed for a whole lake treatment. It's really designed for like cove and beach areas. So a very different type of aeration. Is there any plans in, not in the near future, but in the future of like King's Cove, uh, Henderson Cove, some of the smaller coves that are, you know, are four, five, six feet, and having that system of, uh, you know, solving that. Um, the question is, is uh, some of the shallower coves, if, if there's any plans for them. I mean, that's something we can certainly look into in terms of what impacts are there. So I, I you know, um, Marty asked me, he, he's always said, what's the one thing if that if you could do for Lake Apacon? to really help the lake and it would be to sewer Jefferson. I mean, that would do a phenomenal thing in terms of reducing the phosphorus load going in. This aeration system for the main body of the lake um, would be uh, very important, but then focusing on the watershed is critical as, as well. But looking at those coves and if we start seeing problems in those coves, either, you know, obviously if it's with the weeds, we have the harvesting, but if we do see problems with, um, cyanobacteria, even if we're having this internal load, there may be something that needs to be done in some of those cove areas. So such as circulation or something like that. And something on a completely different note, but I we got back from the North American Lake Management Society meeting uh, last week in Erie, PA, and something we're looking at are near shore areas where, you know, we were talking about how the algae start to grow. And those near shore areas where they start to grow, they're getting their nutrients from the watershed, but they start growing. Can there be measures? And I've been talking to Army Corps about this earlier today. They're looking at measures in those near shore areas, specific types of treatment to take care of those near shore blooms before they get going. So treating them early in the season, like in April, before they really get growing uh, and inactivate those cells. But, but again, that's like you said, that's in the future, and it's something I'm talking to Army Corps about that we're interested in. So, two questions. Um, so, the aeration system in uh, Crescent Cove, you really don't get thermal stratification there since so it's so shallow? Correct. Yeah. Now, what's weird is when you normally don't get thermal stratification. If you have a lot of weed growth, you can actually get some because of the plant growth and you have no circulation, you can actually get some weird thermal things going on. But with so the harvesting, system in there for that. exactly with the harvesting and the circulation system, it helps to minimize that. Um, would it be beneficial or would it be really good um, if we could only do maybe 300 of the nine or a thousand acres this or it's all or nothing. It's yeah, and and it doesn't matter if it's oxygenation or aeration. It's all or none. There have been many times where we have a client who wants to do aeration, and they're like, "Well, we can't afford, you know, all the we can't afford the five um, compressors. We'll put in three. And then they're like, "Oh, it doesn't work." It's like, well, it's because the design was for three. It is with the at least with the internal load control, it's an all or none. You gotta you gotta hit that that oxygen demand. Otherwise, it's it's just never going to oxygenate you know what i mean 
Um, and I guess since the NJDEP is so interested in this, is there an implication that they might contribute towards? No, there's been, I mean, there's been no discussion that they're willing to cough up any. Even if this is the end all, be all, greatest thing. Ever. I mean, they, 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 uh, they appreciated the data. They really liked the study. Um, they seemed surprisingly positive over it. But yeah, we've yeah nothing. Well, they'll sign off on permits, but they won't right. contribute. Right. But if you leave it to Mayor Francis, he'll try really hard to get them to to put something and, in. And so. one last question. Um, you divulge the secret lake in I really can't. Okay. They, they, right. they, they, and I asked, I said, can, can we talk about your system? They're like, yeah, just don't mention our name. You can say we're in northern New Jersey, but don't mention our name. So that's why we keep saying that cryptic phrase, that northern New Jersey lake. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a, the lake community in New Jersey isn't exactly huge. So I, I, you know, I think, I think it could be figured out. So. How much of your proposed operating costs of electricity versus other neighborhoods? That I don't know. I I mean, I, I can't ask that. That's for Paul. He didn't have any numbers to give us right now. And that yeah, we even asked him for this meeting. Do you have any preliminary numbers? And he said no. So we just went back to our original plan from 2021. And, and Paul Cooper, who works for us, put those prices together. I can ask Paul if he has that broken down. Well, I do know. So it'll majority will be the annual cost will be electric and, and oxygen generation compared with maintenance that'll be insignificant compared to that cost that could, mm -hmm. so we didn't mention these the way these are designed these airlines are designed where they can they can float up to the surface for maintenance um, so that really reduces you don't need divers which is a huge cost for most aeration systems so the annual maintenance costs um, should not be huge right This is a crazy question. That's all right. Are, where are you going to put these in the lake? Are you going to have really dead stuff? Um, yeah, I mean. Because, no, I mean, uh, because there's buoys there. You're going to have guys that think, oh, it's fishing all around. They're going to be dropping anchors all over you. So we asked Paul about that. Well, one, I think the buoys, that would be more up to, I think, DEP than, than us. But um, he said they're, I forget what material they're designed with. He said an anchor. He said you'll. You, you can't destroy it with an anchor. You'll lose your anchor um, before. So uh, I don't think it would be a bad idea to mark it so you don't lose your anchor, but it won't be, the the system won't be at risk from from anchors. Yeah, and it's going to be down deep enough that that was the question I had. Are people going to hit it with their with their props? Definitely but, not that. Yeah, it's, it's going to be down deep. Last silly question. Yeah. Um, does anybody else do this business besides this man named Paul? That, you know what? Yeah. Right now, he is the only game in town. So um, the 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 SOD study that he did, it's him and EPA are the only two that do that. And as far as we know, he is the only one. Uh, um, you can see, uh, uh, maybe you can't, um, but he has patent on the technology. So it is pretty exclusive. But like I said, the at first, I, I I saw the technology and I'm like, oh, no, no, it's going to be way too expensive. And then Paul Cooper, who works with us, when he put the prices together and I was seeing how the prices would compare to other types of aeration and we could still preserve trout habitat, I was I was interested in this. And then this lake in New Jersey that installed it and we saw the data that looks very promising. So that's why we have oriented toward Paul. But yeah, you're right. As far as we know, he's the only... He's the only company that we know of that that does this type of technology at this scale. I mean, and like Pat mentioned, there are companies that that use liquid oxygen, but you know that's like you know for Western lakes out in like in the middle of the desert that you don't have to worry if something blows up, you know you don't have to worry about it. It's like we wouldn't even think of liquid oxygen here. So, yeah. Fred, um, I was asked about how uh, long this system will last. Do you have any idea? Um, how many years? So I, I was thinking about that. And again, based on standard aeration, standard aeration systems can can last between 10 and 30 years. So we figure like 20 years. And it, what's weird is a lot of times, even though they can last that long or longer, 
think of 20 to 30 years, the technology changes so much. So there have been aeration systems, like even at Mohawk, the original aeration system we installed was still functioning, but we replaced it with a new one just because the old system was so antiquated. I mean, I remember being out there like tying bricks to a line with perforated holes to lay it down. And now everything, like Pat was saying, now everything's with a weighted line with another line that you can fill with water to lower it, to fill it with air, to raise it up. So the technology changes so much that, um, and again, I'll let Paul directly answer that, but um, I would say 10 to 20 years, you know, and there might be upgrades or improvements that are needed. How old is the system at Schwarzwood, do you know? The, the, the layered air system, that went in when I started working at Coastal Environmental Services in 1993. So, and that's and still, still the, running. It's still running, but again, it's yeah. it's old and it, it needs a lot of tender loving care. So. I think they're set up in a way that they, sh they can be well maintained to, you know, increase the longevity. All right. Well, thank thank you. you. And I hope you come to the second public meeting then when it's when it